The independent media is running circles around the stale and out of touch legacy media. The debate this week proved that to be the case. It's Fake News Friday. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. It is Fake News Friday here on The Candace Malcolm Show. And as for usual, I am joined by my producer and True North journalist, Harrison Faulkner. Harrison, welcome to the program. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Candace. So it was a really fun evening on Wednesday. It was it was a crazy debate. And I, I went through it in some detail with my sort of deep <laughs> criticisms at every level of the way that the official conservative debate uh, was organized. It was in Edmonton. It was hosted by Tom Clark, who was a lobbyist, who was once a journalist. And just everything about this debate was totally cringy and awful. The the format, the questions, the way it was all staged, the lack of audience participation. My, my thesis, my theory on it, Harrison, is that it was all planned by the Conservative Party of Canada. I, I'm usually one to defend the Conservative Party against media criticism. But I think in this case, what happened was that the conservatives just caved so much to some of the negative voices that came out from the first uh, debate, which was organized by the independent conservative group, Canada Strong and Free. I moderated it alongside Jamil Giovanni. And we allowed for a very free flowing discussion. We, we, We really hit on issues that I think matter to conservatives and to Canadians. And apparently the, the brass at the Conservative Party didn't like it at all. They thought that there was too many opportunities for like like potential liberal hit pieces because the Conservative candidates were able to speak their minds too much. And, and then they just didn't like it. They wanted a boring, tame debate with short, short answers, c- cutting people off, no audience participation. And, that, and that's what they got. That, that seems to be um, the, the sort of the 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 format that was placed onto Tom Clark and he he ran from there and also did a, a terrible job of just the questions the topics the way that he wouldn't the way that he was shushing the media all the gimmicks it was just layers upon layers of bad and I did go through it in some detail on my show so I don't want to rehash too much of it but there was another element that I think was also very, very important. And it became very obvious during the scrum. So so first of all, if you just compare the debate that was organized by an independent group and independent media, myself moderating it, it, you know, it was fine. It was entertaining. And we heard a lot of d- disagreement, lots of discussion on substantive issues. The one that was organized by the sort of establishment people, the party bringing in this old, old hand uh, moderator, not good at all. That was basically the consensus is not just from us, from everybody, <laughs> including legacy media journalists. But then the next layer was the scrums that happened after the debates, Harrison, because there was a huge presence of independent media. It wasn't just True North, our own Andrew Lawton was there, but it was also, you know, you had the Rebel asking some great questions, Western Standards, Rachel Emanuel. We heard from uh, just just lots and lots of people. Uh, an individual from the National Telegraph, which is an independent uh, organization. And the questions were interesting. They were substantive. They were asking about a variety of important issues that, that do matter to conservatives and not framed in a sort of got you kind of way, um, asked in a way that that really resonates with how Canadians, I believe, feel. And then, and then you kind of just suppose that with the legacy media. I don't think they had nearly as many journalists who were asking questions in the scrums. And the questions that they asked were, were just stale and, and, and falling flat. So Harrison, I'll bring you in on this. Uh, what was your overall opinion of the debate? And specifically, uh, did you see what I see saw with the scrums in terms of the legacy media just being sort of caught flat footed and the legacy media and, and sorry, and the independent media being the ones who were sort of the, the young, um, ambitious, insightful, excited journalists that were there asking the, the, the punchiest questions. And again, it just made the legacy media look so bad. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, just to start off about with, with the debate, I touched on this in our live broadcast on Wednesday, um, but the format was so bad and it was so, uh, you know, it, it was not at all conducive to any anything that you could consider to be a legitimate debate. They were asking candidates to summarize the greatest threat to Canada and Canadians in 15 seconds, um, and I think it, it was really bad when the moderator couldn't even keep up with the own with, with the rules that he was supposed to follow. I think largely because it was uh, it was totally uh, it made no sense at all. But yeah, Candace, you're right about the way the, really the difference um, between the end the independent media, independent journalists, and legacy media uh, based on one how prepared journalists are for these events and also what kind of questions they come with and 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 really they know what their audience wants so i mean 
at, in the scrums, what we saw were, you know, legacy media journalists asking the same question because I guess they're not creative enough to come up with anything uh, substantive to ask people who want to become prime minister. Um, we saw the French language Alberta CBC reporter ask both Roman Baber and Scott Aitchison how conservatives can win on the cl- on climate when the members don't actually uh, recognize climate, which actually isn't accurate. Um, it, 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 would ta- it shouldn't take a genius to know that that's a classic liberal media talking point. Um, but nonetheless, they couldn't come up with anything unique, so they asked the same question twice. The same thing also happened. Uh, a, a CTV reporter, Bill Fortier, he asked both Jean Charest and Patrick Brown about their thoughts on the format, which everyone agrees was a horrible format. But they couldn't come up with anything uh, legitimate to ask these candidates, Candace. I think uh, I think it's pretty obvious to anyone who attends conservative events that independent journalists are full of energy, full of creativity. They bring they bring a, a new level um, to the work that they do, and the the legacy media journalists are ca- being caught flat footed. Uh, totally, they bring they bring absolutely nothing to the table. Well, it's, it's so lazy. I, I I did hear those CBC questions about climate. It reminded me of how Catherine McKenna, the former environment minister, uh, the uh, liberal politician from Ottawa, she was critical of the debate that I moderated online because she was like, apparently they didn't talk about climate change. And, you know, there you have the loyal, dutiful CBC journalist jumping in to say, like, let's let's all fear monger about climate change. And I did appreciate how Scott Aitchison kind of smacked that question down because he's like, you know, you're misrepresenting what actually happened. I think we have that clip. So let, let, let's play that so you can see this question, the way that the it's framed by the journalist. And then and then you can see Scott Aitchison, who is by no means like, you know, a grassroots conservative or someone who's like really into cultural battles and, and anti-media. Uh, but even he was pretty firm in just saying, what you're peddling isn't true. And I, I think your point, Harrison, about how it's, it's just liberal talking points, uh, he, he, he sort of embarrassed the CBC uh, journalists. So here's that clip. How can conservatives win if they don't have an environmental plan, if their members uh, don't vote for a motion recognizing climate change? Well, I, I think you're referring to actually to an event that occurred during our last convention. Uh, and the situation is a, a little more different than what you've just described. In fact, uh, what that motion did was uh, amend a motion that was kind of poorly worded that does, in fact, acknowledge climate change exists. Uh, and the amendment itself was poorly worded. So in our, in our, uh, in our materials, in our, in, our, in our policy documents, we do, in fact, acknowledge that climate change does exist. It is a reality. Um, and I think you heard tonight some great ideas about how we can move forward with a credible climate change plan that doesn't actually punish the most vulnerable in our society. And, and, and just one final point, Harrison, on the on the climate change issue, I, I would say I, I talked to a lot of conservatives, I talked to a lot of sort of both party insiders and what, what I would classify as just sort of the general conservative base. And I think most people do agree with climate change. They believe it's happening. And most people believe that there's human causes. Well, I, I think when they vote for something like this, and the the, uh, you know, the, 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 the message, or the motion from the convention, which was from a couple of years ago, what, what they don't like is the drumming up of fear, the alarmism, the media narrative that if you don't have the exact kind of policies like Trudeau and the Liberals when it comes to the Paris Accord and shutting down oil and gas and bringing in new punitive taxes on the middle class and on people, uh, on consumers, um, then then you're an out of touch picket. Like the thing that conservatives resent is like the entire narrative being pushed by the CBC. And here is the CBC once again, like not not giving up on it and, and pushing it once again. Yeah, it's this idea, Candace, that the only way um, that Canada can play a role in, in trying to advance, I guess you could call them climate goals, is if we uh, basically shoot ourselves in the foot and destroy all of our natural resource production while continuing to import oil and gas from the rest of the world. Uh, there was very few people who, um, well, obviously in, in the legacy media, no one wants to talk about that, but even still, few people talk about the fact that, uh, you know, w- w- that's that's the liberal way to approach climate change, and conservatives have an understandable uh, frustration with that approach. It's it's anti. It really is an anti-Canada perspective, and no wonder uh, conservatives don't want to don't want to engage in that kind of in that kind of dialogue. Really, anytime a liberal journalist or a legacy media journalist is peddling uh, those liberal talking points, you know exactly what they're trying to do, which is just to try to embarrass conservatives or put them on the back foot and make them dance to the liberal tune. 
Yeah, it's eye roll inducing. And we see it every election that, that they say, like, if you don't have a specific plan to re reduce emissions, therefore you don't care about the environment. And I think that it's time for conservatives to really grab this narrative and say, no, no, the dichotomy you're proposing is wrong. You can care deeply about protecting the natural environment. And we can do that by you know, preserving our lakes and rivers and our forests and making sure we plant more trees and making sure we don't dump sewage into, into riverways and, and, and things along those lines, while also you know, promoting very low emission Canadian oil and gas, which is, you know, innovative and clean and all these things. And I, I, I did think that the debate itself got into that a little bit. And there was some kind of good conversations around Canada's role in producing oil and gas. But you know, this lazy question from the CBC, that essentially just repeating the same question to, to the candidates, just shows, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's laziness. And then same with this, this other question about the format. Of course, everyone agreed the format sucked. But it's like, you, you have one question to ask to the next potential leader of the Conservative Party who has a good shot of becoming prime minister, and you're going to waste it by complaining? Like, why, why not ask it something new? And I, I really appreciated that of all of the independent media, none of them dwelled on the format. That's, that's over. That's done with now. Let's, let's talk about the issues that matter. And, and it was great to see our own Andrew Lawton, he got some great questions in. And, 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 and again, just, you know, these, these sort of young, energetic, uh, like uh, independent media really, really outshining the uh, the legacy media. And I know very few people watch these uh, scrums at the end of debates, but for those of us that did, it was uh, quite illuminating. Well, Harrison, I wanted to keep on this topic of energy and oil and gas because there was a big decision that came out this week, which was that a superior uh, superior court in Alberta, an Alberta appeal a court, sorry, um, voted that the punitive um, harmful bill C-69, which was the um, law that required all kinds of really intensive um, assessments, including like gendered assessments um, that would, you know, I impact whether or not projects would be allowed to go through in Alberta. Basically, this idea like, you know, I think it was dubbed the No More Pipeline Bill um, by critics in Alberta because it was just this really punitive environmental bureaucracy that was placed, uh, uh, this onus placed on uh, oil and gas companies, public companies before getting any anything approved. So the Alberta uh, government pushed back and said this is, this is against uh, the Constitution. They challenged it. And a court in Alberta found that that was right, that, 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 that they agreed with the Trudeau, with, they ad agreed with the Kenny government in Alberta that this environmental impact law was unconstitutional. And I want to, I just want to talk because, you know, the, 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 the theme of the show, and we call it Fake News Friday, because the idea that the media, they, they pretend to be straight news journalists, they pretend to be neutral, um, but really what they're doing is activism, and it's just a charade, like they, they pretend to be neutral, but they're not. And I think this is one of those stories that you might not see it the first time you read it, or you, most people might not catch all of the nuances. But when you read through a piece like this, um, which it was written by the, the Canadian press, of course, that means that it appears in newspapers and websites all across the country. This this one here we have, it was it was placed in global news, but but typically CP runs and everything, including you know, sites that people think of as conservative, like the National Post or the Toronto Sun, they run CP stories as well. CP stands for the Canadian press. Uh, I'm just going to go through this basically line by line because it is incredibly biased. And this, this is, in a nutshell, is, is what we mean when we're talking about fake news and the biased landscape in Canada. Okay, so here's a piece. The headline says, Alberta Appeal Court says federal environmental impact law not okay. So, so here we see right off the bat, um, it, it, it kind of gives us a little explanation of what just happened. It says Alberta's top court said Tuesday that the federal government's environmental impact law is unconstitutional and Ottawa almost immediately announced its plan to appeal. So, so in the first paragraph, uh, we don't even get the news. <laughs> we get the reaction from Ottawa. So, so it's not about how this law is unconstitutional. It goes right to Justin Trudeau plans to fight back. Then uh, we, we, paragraph two, it says the Alberta Court of Appeals strongly worded opinion said the impact assessment it act is an existential threat. Notice the scare quotes there around existential threat to the division of powers guaranteed by the Constitution and has taken a square quote again, wrecking ball to the constitutional rights of the citizens of Alberta and Saskatchewan. The majority of judges sided with Alberta, arguing that the legislation allowed Ottawa to put provinces in an economic chokehold and give it the means to choose winners and losers. Okay, so so we have three paragraphs there, Harrison, that sort of establish the story. And in it, it's already torqued, right? Rather than providing a quote from the judge that, 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 that wrote the decision, that the, the one that won, right, that the, the, there was a vote, and that decision won, 
um, they just pulled scare quotes to kind of like make a mockery of it basically. Um, but again, stressing the fact that we're not done with this and that Ottawa is going to appeal. Okay, so, so that's the first three paragraphs. Fourth paragraphs, it goes straight to Justin Trudeau, right? It doesn't go to the judge who wrote the decision. It doesn't go to anyone in Alberta, the Kenny government in Alberta, who are the ones pushing the, this review. It goes straight to Justin Trudeau basically defending himself, um, saying the justification behind putting the bill in place in the first place. Then we have four paragraphs in a row of Justin Trudeau quotes, okay? So, 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 so we're not getting a fair idea of what is going on, why this case was determined. We are just hearing... Justin Trudeau's justification. I just want to pause right here, Harrison, because if you go back to any of the laws that Stephen Harper wrote in the former conservative government that were struck down by a court, the, the, the emphasis was exactly flipped, right? It would be like this judge, this heroic judge wrote this decision, uh, scrapping this horrible law that Harper tried to introduce, and it would be all about quotes like bashing the government. Whereas here, it's flipped. They don't quote the decision. They quote the prime minister explaining himself and saying why he is right, right off the top. Okay, this is incredibly biased. This is the origin of a fake news story. And, and then it kind of goes on and on and on to provide a bit of background. There's a couple paragraphs here about, again, why the Alberta government challenged it. And then the first quote that we hear from a judge, Harrison, is not from the judge who, again, wrote the decision and, and, and determined that this was unconstitutional, but from a dissenting opinion. So one of the justices that voted against um, this decision, um, saying that the federal environmental law is a valid exercise in constitutional authority. And then here we see that judge, the dissenting judge, and she gets these quotes. Uh, the justice is named Sheila Greckel, and we have, let's see, one, uh, several quotes from her, even though she's not the one that wrote the decision. It goes on to quote a uh, University of Calgary environmental law scholar who also pointed out that, well, this will probably get overturned by the Supreme Court, so this isn't even really all that important. A uh, couple quotes from her, again, downplaying uh, the fact that this that this uh, this decision, this law was just struck down. Uh, then we have another uh, professor. Uh, from from another university, kind of echoing that idea, and we have a third professor, uh, again, just just kind of chiming in with their uh, you know a, a opinion about what's going to happen next. So, all this just to say, th this piece is incredibly <laughs> deceitful, and this is what comes across as straight news. This is what is expected in our country. This is frankly, again, one of the reasons why I started True North, one of the reasons why I think independent reporting, not just podcasts and opinions and, and op-eds, um, you know, opinion columns, but also just the reporting and the news sites, why we stress doing that here at True North. I mean, we, we, we're a small shop uh, compared to a huge outlet like Canadian Press that gets syndicated across almost every newspaper and uh, political website in the country. Um, but you know, this is this is the mindset. This is the way they write news stories. Is it's just it's so dishonest and deceitful and and frankly biased. What what do you think about it, Harrison? Well, your 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 assessment is exactly right. Start start with the headline. Not okay is how they described the Alberta court decision, which the Alberta court ruled that it was unconstitutional. Not not just that it wasn't okay. They really boil it down there and make it seem as though. They, they kind of just only a little bit disagree with this. They don't, they, in, in fact, they declared it unconstitutional. And they don't quote, they actually don't get a full quote from the, from the written opinion of the majority on the court. They don't, they don't quote that anywhere. All they take is the hyperbolic uh, words to describe the, 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 the decision from the, from the judges. So there's no actual, um, there's, there's no real news in this story until I think 29 paragraphs into the story, Candace, when they decide to finally quote Jason Kenney. And this is not just a small deal. The, this, this court challenge was, I think also brought, al brought along or endorsed by Saskatchewan and Ontario. So these are, these are provinces that, that take a, a serious issue with a piece of legislation that has now been ruled to be unconstitutional. And yet we don't get any opinion from the judges that, that made the ruling, and we don't hear from the premier that spearheaded this fight until 29 paragraphs into the story. And this is, a, this is a, an issue I have with a lot of what we see from legacy media, Candace, which is a, a diehard commitment from these journalists to bury the information that actually matters to readers way down into, the, into their story, water down headlines and bury the lead so that people who aren't going to read this, I think, too long of an article, 
Um, they're not going to get to the part where Kenny talks. They're not going to get to the part where the judges actually give their opinion. They're going to give up halfway through because that's kind of the standard now. That's the, that's the uh, attention span that most readers have. So journalists know this. They use these uh, tactics to their advantage. And again, this is why we do this show, to try and show Canadians uh, that this, this kind of news that you're getting from the Canadian press, which gets, as you said, syndicated across the country, uh, can't, be, can't be taken at face value. It requires scrutiny and it requires serious attention. It's hilarious that Justin Trudeau gets, you know, the first four paragraphs, or sorry, he gets four of the first seven paragraphs with his quotes. And then Kenny, the one who led the charge, who won, I mean, the, the quote from Kenny is great. It's like, I'm jubilant. This is a huge win for Alberta. You know, they, they, they bury that in the 29th paragraph. And, and even to go even further in the absurdity, the, the, the story ends, it says there were 17 interveners in this case. And then it says seven of the interveners, including a wide, for, uh, a wide array of environmental and legal groups, as well as First Nations, were in support of Ottawa. So, so even though uh, Alberta had 10 interveners and the feds only had seven, they, 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 they went through and emphasized the importance of those seven interveners who were in support of Ottawa. Like, it's just like every every paragraph of this piece is, is a total farce. And this is a kind of quiet disservice that is done to Canadians. And Candace, right at the bottom of this article here as well, as you point out, they, the second last paragraph shows that not only did they get supported, not only was Alberta supported by Ontario and Saskatchewan, they were also supported by three First Nations and Indian Resource Council. So that's kind of important information. Don't you think that that debunks the narrative of the Liberal government that this is for environmentalism and for First, for First Nations communities. Uh, but of course, that's the lead. It's at the very bottom of the article, second last paragraph. It's, it's, it's really wild. I mean, it's, it's funny because it's so bad, but this is, this is what they pass for news. And they're proud of it and they put it out. They don't think anything of it. And it, you know, it just takes, you literally go through every paragraph of this piece and complain about the way that it is written. Well, again, that that is why True North is here. Uh, this is why you should read your news from True North and not these hacks in the media. Let's move on to the next story, Harrison. This is one that's sort of the gift that keeps on giving uh, for us because the every, every it seems like everything about the Freedom Convoy has been debunked at this point. Like everything the Liberals said, everything Justin Trudeau said during the convoy. I actually think that Roman Babber made that point at Wednesday night's debate that everything the, le the legacy media was saying and everything the Trudeau government is saying turned out to be false. Well, we can just add one more thing um, to the list. As, as you recall, Justin Trudeau uh, made it clear. He said in April that when illegal blockades hurt workers workers and endanger public safety, uh, police were clear that they needed the tools not held by any federal, provincial, or territorial law, hence why they invoked the Emergency Act. So Trudeau was saying that it was because of the police, because of the RCMP. Well, as we heard in the special uh, committee that's looking into this national inquiry into the Emergencies Act and the use of it, uh, which, which I might just add, is entirely framed by Trudeau, you know, a liberal appointed um, person to head this thing. The entire thing is framed not to provide scrutiny at Trudeau as to why he used this, uh, you know, power as an act that, that, that is really supposed to be reserved for wartime, but instead to, you know, look into the reasons that uh, the truckers were bad and the truckers were evil and, and all this stuff. Like the way that it was framed is completely reverse of what the purpose of the, uh, <laughs> the inquiry is. Uh, push all that aside, you know, the, 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 the inquiry itself interviewed the um, the commission itself, sorry, interviewed the uh, RCMP commissioner, Brenda Lucky, during her testimony. Uh, she, she basically just said, no, this wasn't the case. So why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Harrison? Yeah. Um, so in, obviously, the, the, the narrative that we were receiving from the liberal government and from Justin Trudeau was that they had no choice but to enact the emergency, to invoke the Emergencies Act, because that's what law enforcement were requesting the government. Um, it took until, I believe, Tuesday for someone involved in the joint committee to ask Brenda Lucky, the RCMP commissioner, if this was the case directly, if she had requested that the Emergencies Act be invoked by the government. She said no, and, uh, and she went further to say that uh, in, her, in her communication with other law enforcement agencies uh, that she didn't hear that as well from them. We have the clip for this, and we're going to play that clip now. Um, Senator, uh, sorry, um, Commissioner Lucky, we've heard <coughs> multiple times from ministers and others that the Emergency Act and the tools provided were specifically requested by police leadership. As a law enforcement agency with primacy for national security, did you ask the government or representatives for the invocation of the Emergencies Act? No, there was never a question of requesting the Emergency Act. 
There was thought, a question. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, I'm sorry. So you never asked for it. Do you know of any other police leadership that asked specifically the government for, for the invocation? No, we actually reached out to various police agencies when there was talk about some of the authorities within that they were proposing. And of course, we were consulted because we were the ones who would be using those authorities. So we were consulted to see if they would be any of any use to police in these in the context of the Freedom Convoy. So, Candace, this is what this is what really uh, makes me frustrated about this entire process. Not only are we just getting the information now that um, Trudeau's narrative is crumbling even more than it already has. These committee meetings that are of high public interest, you would think a lot of Canadians would want to know what's going on and hear and, and be involved in this process. These committee meetings are happening at 9 p.m. The only way you can watch them is if you go to CPAC or Parl View, which is the uh, which is sort of the live feed of these committee meetings, which frankly most Canadians either don't have time to do or even know where these websites are. And as you said, Candace, the inquiry is being headed by a former liberal staffer judge. So there's no transparency. There's, there's really no accountability that's happening here. And even still, Trudeau's narrative keeps crumbling in front of our eyes. And just out of curiosity, and I think I know the answer to this question, Harrison, is the legacy media covering this? Is this a headline that you're going to see in, you know, the CBC or National Post or any of these? Uh, like, you know, I know, I know they're holding these things at nine o'clock at night. And no one's watching it, but presumably the journalists are watching it. Are they, are they writing about this? No, they're not actually. This is the kind of thing that I think, if it were happening in the United States, for example, it would be held on on primetime television. That Canadians would expect that from from their media, especially the media that gets paid by the government. But of course, that will lead to the coverage we get from them, which is obviously silence, and it is uh, and it's coverage about things that don't matter to Canadians. So, no, Candace, there's no coverage on these meetings. There's no coverage on what comes from these meetings, and I think that's clearly intentional because every time one tunes into these committee hearings, in, into these testimonies, the story keeps unraveling. And it becomes clearer and clearer every day that this was a huge mistake by the government, a huge uh, misstep, uh, and, and a disastrous, uh, a, a disastrous moment that the government should be uh, should be facing facing heat for. But of course, they're not. You're right in that if this was happening in the United States, it would be prime time and it would be around the clock reporting. And it's funny because uh, you know sometimes uh, it's like. Uh, this week, we were kind of looking through the news and looking at what was going on when we were planning out my show. And we're like, oh, it's kind of a slow news week. But it shouldn't be a slow news week because there is lots of stuff going on. It's just that that stuff's not coming forward. Like if you go on to National News Watch, which is a news aggregator, it's a terrible uh, liberal site. But you kind of get an idea for what the sort of establishment people in, in, in Ottawa are reading. And it's all about, um, you know, Ontario candidates who are under heat for things that they've said during that election, most notably Stephen Lecce, uh, a lot of stuff complaining about the conservative debates, um, stuff spilling over about uh, Roe v. Wade. And uh, obviously there was that sort of terrible incident of Jagmeet Singh getting verbally harassed um, by a bunch of idiots. Um, and, and obviously that's terrible, but, you know, the media fixate on these really little kind of irrelevant issues that don't have anything to do with government or policy they're more just kind of like social media things and and then that's the news that's being delivered to canadians rather than the substantive important things about our government abusing power our government wasting money our prime minister involved in ethics scandals the way that he's treated like the the important issues in our country are, are not covered by the news instead everything in the news is just sort of a dumb s s distraction that you know is, is is meant for social media but not you expect something more uh, from the people who get paid lots and lots of money to deliver the news to Canadians and lots and lots of money from the government as well. Well, Harrison, I, I want to, no, no, no Fake News Friday uh, episode would be complete without a, a little bit of focus on our friends over at the CBC. And perhaps my biggest pet peeve in all of Canadian media is the fact that they run this op-ed section where they tell people, uh, allow people to write uh, personal stories of their experiences and the and the, it's called first person and the stories are always just the most sort of uncomfortable, awful left-wing stories about, you know, either 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 hectoring us about how we're not woke enough or, or telling the sad story of their lives. And uh, this one, I mean, I, I, I hate I hate how this story is kind of coinciding with Mother's Day last weekend. And I saw a couple of really despicable people on the left trying to equate 
uh, people's abortions and why they want to be able to not be a mother, conflating that with Mother's Day, which I find as a mother, I find it just so off-putting. Like the whole purpose of Mother's Day is to celebrate mothers, not to celebrate abortion. But we saw we saw that being pushed. Um, there's two pieces on the CBC that, that 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 made me feel that way. One, they they posted this piece just right after Mother's Day. A lady who wrote, who writes, uh, "I love my son, but I wish having him had been my choice." And so she talked about how. Uh, she, you know, she got pregnant at a young age and she was in a religious community. She didn't have the choice. The only thing worse, Harrison, than the left wing movement of shout your abortion, which where they're trying to get women to somehow be proud of, of this uh, decision that they've made um, in ending a life of a baby. The only thing worse than that <laughs> is is this movement of, of people. And I've seen it on left wing sites in the U.S., writing about how they regret having kids or they wish they didn't have a kids while the kid is living. You know, the kid is going to be able to read this piece at some point and they I, I can't imagine why you would put that kind of trauma on your child. Like, even if deep down you felt that way, why would you ever, uh, you know, put voice voice that opinion and put it in print and publish it on a news site and put it in the CBC? Like, it's so disgraceful. It's it's so pitiful. It makes me sad for this individual and sad that the CBC is promoting this worldview. And then there's another one that that sort of doubles down on this whole idea that says on Mother's Day, let's celebrate all mothers, not just mothers with male partners. And so again, they're trying to use Mother's Day to, uh, you know, rather than celebrate families and, and, and motherhood and this be beautiful idea of bringing children to the world and, and giving them opportunities and all this kind of stuff, rather than celebrating the family and mothers, um, they use it to promote their left wing ideology that at its very purpose is to undermine the family, undermine motherhood, uh, push this idea that anyone could be a mother and men can be mothers. And let's talk about LGBTQ2 plus IA, whatever. Like it's, it's just like they can't help but push their left wing ideology at every minute. It's, it's just, it's absurd. And the only, I think really the, based on the quality of writing and storytelling you get from these CBC op-eds, Kenneth, I think it's safe to say that there's, there's only one requirement that the CBC holds in order to publish an op-ed. And that requires you to be a, a radical leftist, some sort of activist who wants to promote a specific lifestyle, obviously in this this Natasha Steer written op-ed about Mother's Day wanting to celebrate um, mothers without male partners. Really, it's not really it's not really about that. It's actually celebrating single mothers um, and being proud of that fact, um, which I find to be just an odd thing for the state broadcaster to be promoting. And at the, the the first story you touched on is this horrible story of this woman who essentially says that she wished she never had. Uh, the son that she gave up for adoption uh, 19 years ago. Obviously, that kid is going to read this story because the mother's name is on it and it's in the CBC. So I wonder how that's going to go down. It's it's really, really, really sad story. Um, but of course, Candace, you're never going to get in the CBC a counter-op-ed. a counter uh, op -ed. Someone that says actually not choosing to have an abortion was a great decision for me. And I'm proud that I gave up, I, I gave someone the life that they have. Um, of course, that's not the message that the CBC wants to push. The message they want to push is that um, abortion should be, women should have abortion, women should celebrate that um, and push for it to be uh, more of a reality than it already is. And I think it's just extremely disgusting that the CBC peddles in this, in this space. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what's going to, what, what it's going to, what's going to happen to get them to stop push, publishing these articles. Uh, but at least it gives us something to talk about every week, right? Well, it's like, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the ideology of the worldview that the CBC is promoting is, is obviously counter to the way that most Canadians think. And so you kind of think, well, you know, why is our money going towards something that's just designed uh, to push really sort of fringe ideas? And, and and not just fringe in a way that most most people would feel really uncomfortable with the idea of someone saying, I wish I'd killed my child as opposed to giving them life. Um, I didn't want to make that sacrifice. Uh, but, but also the, the kinds of things that they're promoting are things that are, are, are not, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're not, it's not good advice to people who want to live a happy and fulfilled life. Like if you follow the advice of these two people in these stories, um, my, my guess is you'll be a pretty miserable person if, if you sit there and dwell and wish that you had killed your child as opposed to giving them life. And you want to celebrate someone who is doing something incredibly difficult. I have, I have a lot of respect for single mothers and I, I believe that most single mothers don't choose to be single. They would prefer to have a, a loving, stable partnership and that that's sort of why we, you know, we have marriage and we've had it for 
that institution survived thousands of years because it's 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 good and it's necessary and it helps uh, raise children in a balanced way. Um, I don't think that people would choose choose to be single, but you know, promoting it as if like you know that's as, as a choice and that's that's a, that's a, a, a noble way to live your life. It's like if you follow that path, you're not going to be a happy, fulfilled person. So C- CBC is just sort of promoting their own loathsome leftist views. It really. Uh, if you follow their advice, you'd be pretty miserable. So not not really a service uh, from our state broadcaster over there. Yeah, you know, Candace, I wish we could have ended the show on uh, on a, on a better note, but <laughs> Like like we always say, at least we'll we'll get we'll get one good CBC op-ed to, to criticize every week, uh, and this is uh, just just another another shocking piece and a to- totally lacks any any you know virtue and uh, and and positive um, positive lifestyle choices. So I think you're right. Well, it's Mother's Day. They could they could have surely found you know a happy, positive story of a mother who's overcome adversity and tell the story about how great moms are and let's all like feel good and warm and fuzzy about you know everyone loves uh, loves mothers. Everyone loves her mom. You know the, the CBC could have could have could have done something positive here, Harrison. But instead, they they pull out these weird fringe areas. And and yes, that is why we do this show. Why we uh, do fake news Friday on the Kenneth Malcolm Show every week. So, Harrison Faulkner, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Right. It's Fake News Friday. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show.